Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Daniel Benjamin, and I'm the director of the Dickey Center, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this event with Dr. Thomas Bogger, uh, the head of the policy planning staff at the German Foreign Office. Um, Thomas Bogger is someone I've known since, um, well, I don't know, almost a decade, half a decade, three quarters of a decade. And uh, I, I uh, immediately liked him because I found that he was, uh, as I said earlier, disarmingly candid, uh, very, very thoughtful, and um, and uh, I would say uh, uh, wide-ranging in his in his interests and and his knowledge. And um, interestingly, he he wound up with the job that um, uh, is sort of optimized for those qualities because to be the head of the planning staff requires an ability to think about economics, about security issues, about uh, the environment, about all kinds of global trends. It's uh, the closest thing that diplomacy has, I think, to unalienated labor. You really get to think big, to, to use a phrase coined by a German uh, political economist. Um, so uh, it's also um, uh, you know, one of those vitally important jobs that uh, if you're not in government, you usually don't know much about. Um, it is uh, the person who is often um, uh, the guy who's whispering in the minister's ear uh, about the big picture and saying, uh, I, th I think we need to lay the groundwork to talk about this issue or that issue, and uh, this is coming over the horizon. Um, perhaps in the German foreign ministry, they think, uh, the regular diplomats think in terms of more than three or four days uh, ahead. Um, but at the planning, planning staff, the planning staff, they have to think at least three months ahead. Uh, in, the, in the U.S. State Department, those time horizons, I'm afraid, are even probably shorter. Certainly they felt that way. Um, uh, Thomas has had a remarkable career. He, um, he uh, has uh, demonstrated that he's too valuable to be uh, allowed out of Berlin. He's worked closely with four foreign ministers. Um, he was a speechwriter for Joschka Fischer, who of course had visited Dartmouth for Klaus Kinkel, uh, for Steinmeier, and was of course chief of staff for uh, Guido Westervelle, and now works again for Dr. Steinmeier. He, um, uh, I met him when he was posted in Washington, where he was political counselor. He uh, was posted in Ankara, uh, always a very important uh, post for, uh, German, for Germany uh, and in Prague. Uh, he holds a, a degree from the University of Maryland at College Park, practically American, and, um, and also a doctorate from Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. We're also fortunate that he's here with his wife, who was right here. Anita is, has joined us. And along the way, he's managed to uh, raise three sons, uh, all of whom are six foot four, is that correct? <laughs> so uh, all above average, I guess, uh, as, as we say in the American vernacular. Um, anyway, um, he, he uh, is also, he's a great catch for us to have here. First of all, it's always amazing when we get anyone who's serving uh, to come here, and especially a foreign uh, official. But it's also a time of uh, profound uh, change, momentous events in Europe. We, of course, um, sort of saw the rebirth of, uh, of uh, Europe as a, as a uh, headline issue with uh, the events in Crimea and Ukraine this summer, but also the Euro crisis, uh, the uh, incredible strength of the German economy, uh, the continuing saga of European integration. Um, there are so many things going on, and, and um, uh, as he will tell you, this is in some ways a, a German moment. And uh, Germany is right now f uh, feeling its way through a transition towards uh, a different kind of foreign policy, um, which is a, a remarkable thing given how uh, uh, deeply ingrained many of the instincts of the, of the uh, uh, post-war period have been in Germany for so long. And it takes a, a lot of courage to uh, initiate a project like that. But I will let him tell you much more about that. It's a great pleasure to welcome Thomas Bogger here to Dartmouth. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you for coming. I should add that the first part of my American education was not the University of Maryland, but it was uh, Norfolk Public High School in Virginia when I was nine and 10 years old for about six months. 
and I learned my first English there. And when I came back uh, in fifth grade to my German high school, um, I, the first test I wrote was an F, and I failed because it was all about grammar, and I hadn't, I hadn't learned anything about that. And the second disappointment was that I, my teacher uh, said, don't speak up in class because your American pronunciation is going to spoil the accent of everybody. His, uh, your American <laughs> accent is going to spoil the pronunciation of everybody else, since those were the days when there was still mostly British English taught in German classrooms, so long gone. Um, uh, yeah, it is in a way a German moment that was the, the title of a talk w I gave last week through a number of, uh, in a number of um, uh, Warburg chapters of the American Council on Germany. And then Dan said, uh, I don't know, I think we'll change it to uh, glo global challenges, German responses. <laughs> and, uh, but I'll, uh, you'll find out that I'll um, sort of, as speakers do, I'll veer back to, the, um, to, to my original uh, to some of my original thoughts on that. Um, I mean, the first question is really, you know, why would German responses matter? Why would anybody even be interested, except for the group that apparently has come here to listen to that? Um, and, uh, and so the, my starting point was really a, a, a title story of The Economist magazine from the late 1990s, I think the summer of 1999, that was portraying Germany as the sick man of Europe, um, singularly ill-equipped for the 21st century, both um, economically with its focus on old-style manufacturing instead of uh, a world of services, and particularly financial services, um, demographically with a shrinking, graying, shrinking population, um, socially being a pretty homogeneous uh, society um, with with little immigration. Um, and um, if you look now, 15 years later, you're looking at a Germany that's, uh, that has undergone a pretty remarkable transformation. Um, and um, even to, agree, to a degree where the economist itself sort of now labels Germany the reluctant hegemon of Europe and is confronting it with all kinds of expectations, uh, in, including on the foreign policy front. So um, sort of my first argument would be that Germany is indeed today um, a country that has adapted amazingly well to the pressures but also to the challenges of globalization and has an amazingly positive outlook, almost un-German in its optimism on, uh, um, on globalization, considering itself one of the winners of globalization, um, sort of having performed well economically, um, um, and, uh, um, and having undergone sort of a transformation in a number of fields that I'll just sketch out very briefly. One is, you know, unification. Um, 25 years ago these days, the wall fell in Berlin and the Iron Curtain fell across Europe. Um, this has been a huge project for Germany. The recent numbers that they put to it in a study this spring was to the tune of two trillion, two trillion euros in, in transfers over the course of these 25 years. But if you look at it, if you look at the sort of the, the substance of unification, the gap in productivity and GDP per capita is not entirely closed, uh, but there has been remarkable success. If you look at um, satisfaction with living standards and the overall situation, um, the, the mood, including in what was East Germany, is you know, better today than it was at any point during these 25 years. Um, but it's also true for overall Germany, where satisfaction with the way the country is run and how the country is doing is actually larger, or, or the numbers are better than they've been at any point over the last 25 years. So that's a, you know, for Germany, that's a remarkably optimistic uh, 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 perspective. Um, unification number one. Number two, what we call in Germany the Agenda 2010, a program of reform, labor market reform, social welfare reform um, that uh, the Schroeder-Fischer government started in late 2003, um, and uh, that really has 
in my view, transform the country, not only in an economic and social sense, but really also in a, in a deeper political uh, way and adapted it to the challenges of globalization. It was in many ways a, a rewriting of Germany's social contract, um, adapting it to a globalized economy, and all the while preserving its strong uh, state, business, labor relations, and a strong sense of social cohesion, which has always been a hallmark of, um, of, of Germany. Um, the third has been how Germany, the third strength, how Germany has been able to transform and adapt its manufacturing sector, um, which was, which was seen to be almost outdated in the late 1990s to um, the era of globalization. And not because of particularly long-term strategy, but really more because of a combination of a deeply ingrained skepticism towards short-term shareholder value driven model of doing business on one side and the peculiar structure of a lot of German manufacturing on the other, which are, a lot of them are small and medium sized companies, um, family owned, inherited from generation to generation, but world market leaders in their own, uh, in their own product uh, niches and, and sectors. And so they have profited uniquely first from European EU enlargement to Central and Eastern Europe in 2004, expanding production, uh, profiting from cheaper labor there, from new markets, but then particularly from the rise of China and much of Asia. Um, and for a lot of the made in China products that you'll, you'll buy around the US, many of them are being produced on, on German machine tools actually. Um, and most of them come from Southern or Southwestern Germany. Um, the fourth point is the, is the strong German focus on sustainability and a greener economy. And you may sort of include the whole question of the Energiewende, the energy transition away from nuclear to renewables in that category as well. It really is um, you know, driven by a deep sentiment, um, a deep anti-nuclear sentiment in Germany that, that really cuts across parties. Um, but also a strong sense that uh, the question of how you decouple material consumption from the depletion of natural resources will be one of the defining challenges of the 21st century. And that uh, a country like China can't possibly follow our trajectory uh, of a resource intensive growth uh, without that having systemic consequences. So it's not only about reducing emissions in Germany or in Europe or in the US, it's also about developing the technology and the concepts that, are, that we're able to export and that are applicable in countries like China and Asia. And, um, and that's certainly an investment uh, that Germany has been making and continues to make um, in order to provide those concepts, ideas, and technology um, to, uh, for, for a more sustainable future. And the final strength that I would mention that, uh, that has contributed to that transformation of Germany over the past 15 or so years is um, immigration and the whole trend towards a far more diverse society. Uh, by now, um, you know, I tell, these, they tell this story how my, my parents' generation, my parents still believed that they could tell who's German and who isn't by looking at someone in the streets because it still was a predominantly ethnic concept of uh, uh, of citizenship. And by now, there are 15 million out of the 80 million Germans who have a foreign background, foreign born, or parents or grandparents foreign born. That's almost 20% of the population. So it's a far more open, international, diverse, and at least if you go to Berlin, also far more creative uh, society than it has been in the past. And I, and I think broadly uh, for the better. Um, now, with, with all of that, if there is something like a German moment, then um, to what purpose um, are we going to employ it? And there is an intense debate now that the new German government came into office late last year, December last year. There's been an intense debate ever since about the future role of Germany in international politics, the goals, the interests, the extent of our responsibility and the limits of it, um, the instruments of foreign policy that Germany should deploy, 
Um, we have run, but we still are running a, a major project that we call Review 2014, which is exactly about that. Uh, we've asked uh, 50, 60 experts, most of them foreign, um, two very simple questions. What, if anything, is wrong with German foreign policy and what should, we, what should be done to fix it? Um, and it's, so we've had a series of very interesting responses to that that uh, show the um, huge expectations when it comes to Germany's role um, and uh, partly contradictory expectations but, uh, but also a, a surprising degree of consensus that I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, we've, then, we've then done um, and are still in the process of doing a, a series of town hall meetings with uh, German citizens all across the country to uh, engage them on foreign policy because there is clearly something you can measure in the polls, a rather deeply ingrained hesitation to play a more active role in the world um, and to sort of get involved with that, uh, uh, with messy problems uh, beyond our borders. Um, and in a third phase at the end of this year, once I'll return to Berlin next week, we'll engage our own staff, um, not only on the question of do we do the right thing, but do we do it in the right way? Because it also has to do with the adaptation of the organization, uh, the way younger diplomats think about Germany's role in the, way, in the world, how we, and, and the instruments that we have at our disposal. So in many ways, it's sort of it's almost a mirror of uh, of debates going on in the United States, uh, which has carried uh, a lot of the burden of international order for such a long time. But it comes from a very different starting point. And, um, so on this project and on the debates in Europe in Germany over this past year, I'll give you three three very preliminary conclusions in, from from my perspective. The first is. And that's a remarkably broad consensus uh, among, also among the foreign and the domestic expert community, that there is only a successful and productive and good role for Germany in international politics in and through the European Union. So that European integration really is and should remain at the core of any German foreign policy strategy in the future. And that, of course, immediately begs the question, well, then what do you do with the Eurozone crisis that has been plaguing Europe for the past, well, better part of the last five years? Um, and I won't take you through all of that history, but it, um, it's quite obvious that that crisis is not yet over, that it involves some issues of also of institutional construction. We've created a single currency in 2002, but we still have 28 more or less discrete economic and fiscal policy-making processes that remain uh, the domain of the member states. And, and this um, institutional setup has led to a development where the 18 economies of the Eurozone member states have not converged as was the the plan, the idea behind the introduction of the single currency, but they've actually diverged uh, to, to an unsettling degree, uh, putting the Eurozone's cohesion under large stress and forcing a series of bailout programs and rescue mechanisms and pretty divisive debates about the degree of solidarity and the necessity of reform. And from all I've told you earlier about the transformation that Germany has undergone, it'll come as no surprise that the German position on what other EU and Eurozone member states should do pretty closely mirrors the German experience of, of welfare, labor market reforms, um, sort of trying to raise competitiveness of, uh, of, uh, the, of domestic industry, export industries, and so forth. And, um, and I would say that if I, you know, if I look ahead, I think given the, the paramount importance of European integration to Germany, not just economically, but politically, because it's the only successful answer in our centuries-old history to that German question of being the largest country at the center of the European continent, 
um, I think in the words of Henry Kissinger, sort of too, too big to be just one among many and too small to dominate the continent. So that the only successful answer was really the answer of integration that we found after the catastrophe of the Second World War. Given that paramount importance of European integration, the, the worst strategic dilemma a German leadership could face would be a situation where you feel you would have to choose between two options. One is to continue on that path of European solidarity, integration, trying to keep the Eurozone and the European Union together uh, with Germany playing a central role in that on one side. And on the other side, the option of being a prosperous uh, and competitive economy in, a, in an increasingly globalized uh, world economy. If these two are, would be no longer compatible because we're not able to move the Eurozone and the entire European Union on a more competitive path and as an open system in an open world economy, then Germany would be in real trouble. So our paramount interest is to prevent that strategic dilemma from unfolding, uh, from becoming a reality and, and really trying to forge a deal at the center of the Eurozone, which means above all, an agreement, a grand bargain between Germany and France uh, that, can, uh, that sort of combines the economic philosophies of both, uh, that pushes reforms in France and other Eurozone economies, but that also sort of makes it easier for them to do that because Germany does its own share in terms of increasing investment and, uh, and pulling the Eurozone through that crisis. Um, the second conclusion is that we're, we're living in times of strategic surprises and crises, notwithstanding policy planners trying to do their best to predict what's coming. We continuously fail at that. Um, and we've, been, we've been surprised this year at least three times by what Russia has done in Ukraine, uh, by, the, by the willingness of the Kremlin to escalate the situation, to annex Crimea in blatant violation of international law, um, to lead an undeclared war in eastern Ukraine, to really put into question uh, the entire post-war, post-wall uh, European security order. Um, we've been surprised by the emergence of the Islamic State uh, and, the, and, and, the, and the powerful radicalization message of, uh, of the caliphate in, uh, in northern Iraq, northern Syria. We've been surprised by the extent of the Ebola crisis and the risk that it poses um, to, uh, to, to, to a spread than really becoming a, a, a global pandemic. Um, so in, in reality, we don't know where, the, where we'll be surprised next time. We know that as foreign ministries, we will have to deal with crises in the future probably multiple crises, parallel crises, but in many ways we're not very well equipped to deal with them. Also, at, not just on a policy level, but really at an organizational level. If, uh, you know, I come from a, from a military family and done my own military service, but if I, you know, if I were a military officer and I have a sort of a front line, uh, if I look at the foreign ministry, where I can barely see my fellow soldier to the left and to the right, and I have absolutely no reserves to throw at a, at a strategic surprise, um, I'd be very worried if I knew only one thing, that that surprise is going to come. The next crisis is going to happen, but I don't know where and when, and I have no reserves to really throw at the problem. And, um, and so I think that is something that we, as Germany, that we really need to focus on. We need to become better at crisis management. We need to uh, develop our instruments on that. We need to have, have more resources uh, for these kinds of problems. We have, as we speak here today, um, we've had a major international conference in Berlin today um, on the Syrian refugee crisis uh, and particularly what it does in neighboring countries. So a country like Lebanon that has taken in more than a million refugees and is really aching under the, under the pressures of integrating, supplying them, and without disintegrating itself under that pressure. And the same is true for Jordan and, and other places. So how do we deal with that? What can we do in 
terms of humanitarian responses and, um, and, and in support for these neighboring countries in order to, if we're not really able to address the root causes of the problem in Syria, and we've been discussing that over the last two days, I couldn't come up with a great idea for that, uh, uh, how, to, how to solve um, the Syrian crisis, but that at least we can do something to contain, um, contain the effects on the whole region um, and, uh, and alleviate some of the suffering there. Um, in the case of Ukraine and Russia, it's an interesting case because um, Germany has, um, has been, I would say, less of a reluctant hegemon in the Russia-Ukraine crisis. It has unusual for German foreign policy so far um, taken a lead um, in a lot of the diplomatic negotiations um, with Russia, and not just out of tradition, but also because we felt that the paramount, the paramount task of organizing the Western response was really to uh, create a unified European position, a unified European and Western answer. Um, and if you think about it, among the 28 EU member states, you have at least three distinct narratives um, about relations with Russia. There are those who've lived under Soviet occupation, as in the Baltics or Poland and the Central Europeans. There are those who think that Russia essentially always has, a pretty, has been a pretty faraway place. Portugal, Spain, Italy, um, France to a certain degree. And then there's the particular narrative in Germany, which, as a divided country, which uh, went through that uh, history that told us that both resolve and detente uh, were sort of the being part of the NATO alliance, but also uh, pursuing an Ostpolitik of engagement with the Soviet Union, in the end produced German unity and German unification in a peaceful way. And uh, to integrate those three very different narratives, historical experiences, and interests, actually, in relations with Russia has been a major focus of the German diplomatic effort over the past eight months. And then coordinating that with the US perspective. So when Chancellor Merkel was in Washington on the 2nd of May, um, her joint press conference with President Obama really set out uh, the benchmark for, um, uh, for the Russian uh, acceptance and acknowledgement of the Ukrainian presidential elections on May 25, and so that was a successful step. We haven't really been able to solve the crisis, and I'm afraid that will take a long time because in the end we're dealing with a Russia that increasingly defines its own future in opposition to the West and no longer in cooperation with the West. So even if we find a settlement in Ukraine, that doesn't mean we can go back to business as usual with Russia. But it's all the more important that we put on a united um, response vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis that, that type of aggression and make it very clear, sort of have a very clear and united signaling, both as the EU and the US and within NATO when it comes to the reassurance of NATO members on one side but also an offer of political uh, talks and engagement with Russia uh, over the longer term. Um, so become better equipped, become actually to become better at crisis management is the second one. And then I mention a, a sort of my third conclusion where I think German foreign policy in the future would, uh, would need to invest more resources, um, more, more ideas, more creativity is really on the question of, uh, of the future of, of order uh, in the world. Analytically, it's very easy to make a case that we need more global governance for a whole host of global problems, from refugees to climate change uh, to global pandemics and so forth. But in reality, the order that we have, the institutions that we have, many of them built under US leadership after the, after the Second World War, are being contested, they're, they're fraying at the edges, they're partly being um, you know, challenged by parallel institutions, uh, you know, take the, the BRICS bank uh, of Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, that they've just decided to set up uh, um, to, to be more independent of a US and Western-led international financial system. 
Um, so we're, you know, we're barely able to keep up with defending the old order that we have created, and that served us very well, and that especially served a country like Germany very well, that if you take it all together, trade, investment, but also the flow of, of people and the flow of information is really one of the most connected countries around the globe. Um, and a lot of our prosperity and security depend on a predictable and reliable international order. But we don't know what we're moving into. So we, we can't simply limit ourselves to defend the old order. We also need to spend thinking and ideas and time on, on what's coming, what we're moving into. Um, and I'll mention just, just two of them, um, because I think the, the order we're moving into, will, it will not be as coherent as the one that we know that was essentially created when the United States was a hegemon in the international system after the last war it will be more of a patchwork of elements of order, some regional, some functional, not all of them at the same level of rulemaking, not all of them perfectly matching. Um, but we can do some things. We can work together on, especially on the challenges of the digital age, on that from a German perspective, especially on that proper balance of security and privacy in the digital arena, um, which I think would be you know, is, is a task of paramount importance, not only for the future of our economies and our societies, but also for that transatlantic link um, uh, for a younger generation that has not lived through the experience of the Cold War and that close transatlantic uh, security alliance of the time. And the second one that I'd mention is um, uh, the, the much debated transatlantic trade and investment partnership, which apart from that as being negotiated these months and, and hopefully um, uh, accomplished sometime next year. Um, but it's um, far beyond the, the gains in, in jobs and growth on both sides of the Atlantic. I think it would also send a powerful signal that we're able to establish advanced norms, rules, and standards that could actually be um, copied, adopted by others, that we could pull uh, the international uh, trading and regulatory system forward, that we could leave an imprint, actually, on the way we want globalization to be done and to be run in the future, and not be, sort of, not run the risks that standards and rules are in the end being set elsewhere, and, and according to very different, a very different set of, uh, of values and priorities. So these three I would mention, Europe, still paramount for Germany. Crisis management in a world where crisis will be not an exception, but really the new normal. And number three, um, creating elements of order. I wouldn't call it a sort of a new order, but elements of order, be it regional, be it functional, wherever we can. And I think there's huge potential to do that um, together uh, across the Atlantic. Um, but as I said, the project, this review project, is going to run a year, so the foreign minister will officially announce what he thinks about that, and I don't have more than an advisory role in that. Uh, so consider this a sneak preview of my advice, but not of the final outcome and <laughs> of that. Uh, you know, there's no, there's no, in the, in the world where change is so quick and so fundamental, there is no guarantee for uh, continued success for a country like Germany, but I think, um, you know, for 2014, um, we're happy to, uh, to be, as, as Roger Cohen put it in his July 2014 commentary in the New York Times, Germany is Weltmeister, and that uh, extends far beyond uh, the World Soccer Championship. Um, the reality is that in the sweepstakes that we did in the policy planning staff, only two out of 20 saw it coming in July that Germany... So that gives you a final idea of how limited our prognostic capabilities are. Thank you. Well, Thomas, uh, thanks very much for a, a real tour d'horizon, to use a, a, a non-German word. Um, I can tell you, though, that um, if you're looking for a good member of the staff, my son knew that the Germans were going to win the World Cup. Um, 
So um, with that very personal plug. So um, as always, a very uh, felicitous uh, view. So naturally, I have to respond by uh, giving you a hard time. Um, a, f a, a more uh, pronounced, a more uh, a greater leadership role in and through the European Union. So um, on the one hand, an Amer a typical American response would be uh, great. Integration is, is, a, is a great goal. This is not, I would say, a widely, necessarily a widely held American view, but it is, it is one held by many. And then the flip side of it would be, and if you're going to show foreign policy leadership through the uh, European Union, it's a recipe for an action. What's the, uh, what's the response there? You've got 28 people around the table. You've got such a range of different viewpoints. You have a bureaucracy that works um, impressively, but quite slowly. Um, and, um, and, and many, and you know, Malta has the same vote that uh, Germany does. So uh, tell us how it's going to work. Well, I think the reality is uh, in the U.S. foreign policy system, there are also a lot of people around the table and a lot of different views. And sometimes I say your interagency process is actually what we have around the council table. But that, you know, that's maybe a cheap shot. So um, I, um, if you've noticed lately, the State Department and the Defense Department, at least the, the recent incumbents, have, have gotten their revenge at, that, uh, at the centralization of foreign policy in the White House. So yes. It hasn't yes. been working very well uh, lately. Yeah, and I don't think, you know, we are at, uh, we're, at, we're at a crossroads in that sense that there's a new team in Brussels coming in as well. So uh, with, uh, on the 1st of November, there will be a new commission in charge, a new commissioner and, and high representative for foreign policy, uh, Federica Mogherini from, from Italy. Um, so, uh, you know, she certainly has her work cut out for her as well in better coordinating not just the Brussels institutions, sort of integrating what the Commission does on development aid, on trade policy, with what the European Foreign Service, the External Action Service, does on, on the more narrow uh, foreign and security policy. But also, of course, of shepherding the 28 member states. And that, uh, you know, you can call that a mission impossible. Uh, but there are things that you, uh, I think, that, uh, that, that can be improved. And I think overall, you know, if we, if we don't have, we should be careful not to have unrealistic expectations. So there will be no centralization of European foreign policy. I think that's just, that would be unrealistic to, to say, what can we do to no longer have different perspectives, for example, on relations with Russia or on relations with Northern Africa? Um, Th these are deeply ingrained. They go back centuries. They relate to colonial histories, to geographical location. Um, it, I think it would be far too technocratic a perspective to say we can solve this by some kind of an institutional setup and we define away these differences. So the challenge really is to, um, to integrate um, these different perspectives and interests and try to um, through a process, which is the way Brussels always works, uh, sort of narrow the differences, define goals that everybody sim can subscribe to that are not only the lowest common denominator, and then maybe even set in motion sort of a, a strategic debate uh, that will try to define some of the, some of the most important um, uh, issues for, for all member states. And I think that's particularly true um, for the neighborhood, so for because crises both in the east and in the south, sort of south of the Mediterranean, have come much closer to, to Europe, uh, to our borders than we would ever have expected, and inclu that includes the Middle East, actually Iraq and Syria, um, and and we need to rethink that, and we need to do it all 28 of us. Can't be that 10 countries worry about what's happening in the south and 10 countries worry about what's happening in the east. And, and then they compete in Brussels over resources and, and attention. Uh, and that, that'll be her job to, to, to essentially do that. Um, but I think part of the answer is also a certain degree of tasking and outsourcing, if you will. You had three foreign ministers in Kiev in late February negotiating with President Yanukovych. Uh, that was what we call the Weimar Triangle. Uh, the, the French, the German, and the Polish foreign minister. Uh, the Europe has 
a number of these formats of these subgroupings. You don't want to send 28 foreign ministers, and the EU high representative can't do, sort of can't pretend that she can do everything herself. So she will run the Iran negotiations, she takes care of the Balkans issue, she may choose to do other things, but there are simply too many crises, uh, too many issues to be dealt with. Why not turn uh, this diversity of 28 foreign ministers plus a European superstructure into an advantage and, and sort of tasking certain groups of uh, countries and their foreign ministers with taking care of a specific issue, but not along their own narrow interest, but along sort of a, a mandate of the, of, of the 28. I, I think that, you know, that won't work perfectly, uh, but I think there's, um, there's not only room for improvement uh, uh, compared to the last few years, but, um, but there is, um, I think there's an actual chance to, to improve that. And sort of final point, I think you know, there will always be frustration at the pace of decision making in Brussels, but we should, un we should also acknowledge that part of the strength of Europe in foreign policy making is that it has a long-term structural transformational power that it has deployed with the enlargement to Central and Eastern Europe that it employs through its association agreements. A lot of that comes through sort of long-term structural transformations and not so much by being able to turn on a dime and, and take a decision. Um, certainly not the way decisions can be taken in Moscow where everybody's, everything's geared towards a single person, um, nor the way it is being done in Washington. So let me ask you the, uh, the follow-on question, which uh, you could you can hear rising from, uh, from the ground in Washington, which is, what are the implications of this new look in German policy uh, on, the, uh, on the security side of things? Um, you know, I think there's been uh, a desire to see Germany and Europe writ large uh, play a, a greater uh, role in terms of uh, uh, you know, providing global security of, of uh, in many ways, uh, uh, allowing America to, uh, to uh, uh, relax some of its efforts uh, really since going back to the, to the early 90s. Um, and, um, the trend lines, at least before uh, the annexation of Crimea, were very much going in the wrong direction. And there was a sense that we were living in different security universes. And I guess the question is, uh, have events changed that? And has thinking in Germany uh, changed that? Well, I, I, think, I think reality sort of events help to shape thinking, right. um, at least if you're not uh, stuck in an ideological uh, mindset. Um, so, um, so we used to say when we started this, what we call uh, the Review 2014 project, early in 2014, after four or five months, uh, someone from in the ministry came up and said, well, somehow reality has decided to brutally involve itself into that review project, hasn't it? Uh, and, and sort of really underscored the importance of all the questions that we had already put out there or that we had come up with. Um, you know, I don't... You know, I know that American expectation, and it's not only an American expectation, uh, especially on security policy. Um, uh, I'm not sure we will entirely agree on the metric of, of measuring that more active German foreign policy. But if you look at it over, only over the past 10 months now that this government has been in place, I remember a very early decision in January where we decided that we have one of the most advanced institutions to deal with chemical waste and, and toxic material um, in Munster and Lower Saxony, very close to where I was born. Um, when the US decided to destroy Syria's chemical weapons on, uh, on, on the Cape Ray, on that ship in the Mediterranean, under the last government, we said, okay, we'll, we'll give two million euros to the uh, organization for the uh, abolition of chemical weapons in The Hague to support the effort to destroy this stuff. 
but we won't do anything else. We'll give them money and that's it. And in January, when Steinmeier heard of that uh, decision, he said, well, why don't, we, why don't we offer the facility that we have, that we actually built to destroy our stockpiles of old chemical uh, ammunition from the First World War, which is still to this day being, being destroyed there. Why don't we offer that for the, sort of for the products that come out of the, um, I don't know what you call that in English, but uh, the, this, this hydrolyse, hydrolyse process um, of, of the Syrian chemical weapons. And that's what we did. And we said, okay, we're ready to take hundreds of tons of the stuff that comes by ship to Wilhelmshaven, I think, and then is transported by high security uh, transport to that facility. And we'll burn it there. Um, and, and that's part of the German contribution. So that's a very small, but it is sort of an example where we say, if there is an instrument that we have at our disposal that we can use to make the world a little safer, we should employ it and we should be ready to take sort of the very limited risk that comes with it rather than simply writing a check. Um, second example that I would give is uh, on the Iraqi issue, on the, on the Islamic State issue. I mean, the German government has decided in late August to deliver weapons to the Kurdish Peshmerga to defend themselves against the fighters of the Islamic State. There are plenty of people in Germany. It's quite a lively debate, actually, that's going on, especially on the political left that says, we've never done that. We've never delivered weapons into a conflict zone. There can be all kinds of unintended consequences. Who knows where they will end up? It's a difficult decision. But we said, simply saying, we're delivering more humanitarian aid to them at a time when they were fighting for their lives was not a sufficient answer. It was sort of, there was like an operational gap in the German approach to that. So we've decided to deliver those weapons. And, um, and there are others who will say, yeah, but why are you not flying sorties and bombing um, uh, the Islamic State? Well, we've decided not to do that, but we were early on that weapons delivery um, and that is something that we were able to actually, if you want to explain and, and, uh, and sell as a credible and appropriate uh, answer of German security policy to that given and, and new problem. And on the issue of Ukraine and Russia, I, you know, I would, I would argue that's a huge security problem, even though we all said across the Atlantic that there is no military solution in the sense that we would fight on behalf of the Ukrainians uh, against Russian irregular or regular troops in eastern Ukraine. But still, Germany has taken a very important role in trying to defuse the conflict and trying to empower the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, to actually monitor um, the agreements, uh, uh, the Minsk agreement between Ukraine and Russia. So I would consider that also to be um, part of the, you know, of, 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 an, of an active German role in security policy, just as on the sanctions issue. You know, it's relatively easy for the U.S. to, um, to implement sanctions against Russia. There's not much of a trade uh, uh, between Russia and the U.S. If you compare U.S.-Russia trade with EU-Russia trade, it's not even 10% of what we Europeans trade. So if you talk about sanctions against Russia, the real cost actually falls on the European side. And it doesn't fall all you know, well distributed. The financial implications are mostly for the city of London and the British. Uh, when, you, when it comes to, to arms, it's mostly the French who pay a price. When it comes to machinery and manufacturing, it's mostly the Germans. And so you have to balance all of that. And only if you spread the pain and the cost you stand a chance of making those sanctions sustainable in the long term. Um, and uh, so all of that are examples for me, but they don't, I know they don't uh, sort of easily answer American expectations. Why don't you spend 2% of GDP on defense? Um, and we do spend 1.4, I think, at the moment or something. Um, you know, I wouldn't exclude um, a rise of German defense spending in the longer term. I wouldn't exclude a process of um, you know, a new white paper on security and defense policy in Germany over the next month and years where we sort of reflect on our, uh, on our broader security environment, which has changed. Um, but, uh, but it's quite clear that the German debate on that, on that more active foreign and security policy is not limited to sort of defense spending or, or employing the military instrument, because our experience is 
you know, that doesn't help, uh, that doesn't necessarily help solve problems uh, that we're confronted with around the globe. So we shouldn't exclude it, but we also shouldn't bet too much on it. Okay, well, I could ask questions, um, you know, till the cows come home, but uh, at this point, why don't we open it up to uh, the audience? So, <coughs> yes, right here. Uh, excuse me. How do you work your way through the, the budget crisis that uh, Germany is for adhering to the budget agreement? And I guess I'm Italy sorry. is trying Can you take the mic and one? maybe repeat the question so that how the do you wonder. How do you work your way through the question of the budget crisis where Germany wants to adhere to the budget agreement and, and uh, Italy and I think France I want some kind of relief. And I, how do you work your way through it? Probably carefully. But <laughs> <laughs> yes. As, uh, yes, I would say as carefully as possible. I mean, the uh, sort of the bottom line, if you want to boil it down, really is... Um, you know, as I try to set out that strategic dilemma, in the end, France's weakness is also Germany's problem. Um, and on the specifics now of the budget crisis this autumn, because every country under these new stronger rules has to submit its budget to Brussels for approval. And there was a sort of a, a potential train wreck uh, coming. But as so often in Europe, it's not really materializing. And both Italy and France have now agreed to revise their budget proposals that they're submitting to the Commission in Brussels so that it actually um, uh, meets the, the criteria, meets the rules that have been set out. So both of them, despite some rhetoric to the contrary over the last two to three weeks, have now um, submitted budgets that actually meet the requirements and meet the rules. But of course, that doesn't answer sort of the, the larger problem that they have difficulties in meeting those rules, in, in meeting the, the, the rules that they themselves agree to if their economies keep uh, struggling. And, uh, and, and so there's the, the philosophical debate of whether you have to uh, give some um, relief um, a, a sort of spending relief before growth, in order that growth returns, or that whether growth returns only if you've undergone those structural reforms, which is sort of the German experience of 2004, 2005. But admittedly, we've also had a time lag then in the German case um, that we tend to forget when we, uh, when we give our advice to our colleagues in, in Italy and in, and in France now. So this will, it will remain a challenge. But, the, the, but you also have to understand that the German insistence on other Eurozone member states adhering to the rules that we've jointly established after the first round of the Euro crisis in 2010-2011 is not just because of some you know, outlandish German obsession with specific numbers. Or so. it's, it's also informed by the reality that financial markets um, uh, sort of financial markets are looking very closely whether the new regime in the Eurozone is actually credible and will be enforced. And they have, you know, they've gone along for a long time from 2002 from the introduction of the common currency. For many years, there were practically no interest rate differentials for, for sovereign debt issued by various Eurozone member states. And then suddenly in late 2009, early 2010, these spreads, as we call them, they shot up and became a huge burden on some of these countries. And that is, you know, we've been able to bring those spreads down with the help of the monetary policy of the ECB, but also with the promise of tighter rules and, and, uh, and strict adherence to these rules. If we start violating them and saying, oh yeah, we agree to them, but in reality, you know, we'll have to wait until growth returns, until we can really enforce them, and until we really think they're binding. Uh, we'll get ourselves into trouble, and we're undermining the credibility of the whole system again. And the risk is that we will see increasing spreads, uh, more difficulty for uh, refinancing of these countries again, and that's why it's such an important issue to to us as well. So there's a bigger there's, a, there's, a, there's something bigger at stake than simply a, a German uh, 
preference for balanced budgets. So it's worth noting here that in German, as opposed to most languages, debt and guilt mean are the same word. <laughs> you should try that also, maybe. <laughs> You mentioned three surprises, uh, Ukraine, ISIS, and Ebola, and you covered German responses to the first two. What is the current state of uh, Germany's plans and involvement uh, in the Ebola crisis? Um, yeah, I, I, think, I think on Ebola, it, you know, it's a, it's a particularly good case to demonstrate how our, our system of response was was unprepared for the not just for the for the size of the crisis but really for for mobilizing meaningful help so um, you know for the Europeans who've now at, at the EU summit uh, late last week they increased the EU's aid for uh, for the Ebola uh, for combating the Ebola crisis and supporting the states in Western Africa to 1 billion euros that's a, that's a comparatively easy thing to do. To recruit and equip medical personnel that you can actually send there to, to help is infinitely more difficult. And you know, we can send, the US has mobilized uh, thousands of military personnel, um, which you can mobilize in an instant and send because that's well prepared. But they're also not, they are not medical personnel, so they can't actually treat people. How do you recruit, insure, um, and find people who, who would be willing and able to help? And how, do you, how can you responsibly send them down there um, and send them into that dangerous environment? Um, one of the prerequisites is that in case of infection, you have um, a guaranteed um, medical assistance and an ability to evacuate them and bring them back. And we've been working now for the last two and a half months on that issue. There are two planes, I think two American planes of a private company that are equipped to do these transports of, of a sort of, of, a, of a fully infected Ebola patient. Um, we're, we're currently in the process of equipping a Lufthansa plane with that kind of uh, you know, cabin, sort of uh, a treatment cabin inside. It's such a difficult process, takes time, needs to be certified, needs to be tested, it, you know, but to have that ready uh, um, in November, so over the course of the next four weeks, so that we can really responsibly also send some medical personnel and assure them that in the case that they are infected over there, we have the ability to transport them back and treat them in German hospitals uh, that are equipped to do that. That's just one of the sort of one of the many challenges that that we've that we've faced, uh, where we said even if we find people that are willing and able to go down there as as you know uh, doctors without borders, they were actually the only NGO that had. Um, sort of a standard protocol for a crisis like that. How long would they keep people there? Um, you know, what were what were the the protective measures that they would uh, the protective uh, uh, rules that they would have to follow? The, the the governments have been all across the world. I would say have been very have been very ill-equipped and very slow to do that. We have excellent medical centers even for tropical diseases the Robert Koch Institute in Berlin, something like the CDC in Atlanta, they're all very good at advice, but they're not operational agencies that actually can send military personnel and have the equipment to bring these people back. So one of the, sort of this is very much a, a crisis, actual operational crisis management situation now, and, and we're trying to coordinate the various effort, and we hope to be, you know, to really step up this effort and and build up uh, uh, local hospitals in the area with that rescue chain uh, in place. But, but the longer term question really is, um, you know, is something my foreign minister called sort of white helmets in a, you know, do, does it make sense to create the logistics and possibly a pool of people who would be ready to respond to such a crisis, which you can't have as a sort of standing medical army, but you can, 
sort of you can have the logistics and the crisis protocols in place for for future contingencies like that that would allow us to respond much quicker because we i mean in all honesty we we underestimated the crisis we it's not that it came as a complete surprise i mean the outbreak had been there uh, early in the year but we were busy with ukraine we were busy with other things we thought this had happened before in the region but it's very limited and when it suddenly took off exponentially, you know, we found ourselves being very, very ill prepared for that. So considering some of the deflationary pressures that are currently facing the EU, as well as perhaps some of the measures taken by the ECB recently, notably the negative interest rate, um, is it time for Germany to adjust its current fiscal outlook towards other EU countries for a more pro-growth or even American-style uh, stimulus package in order to prevent a decade, a lost decade similar to Japan in the 90s? Uh, yeah, that's, that's probably the million-dollar question right now in the, uh, in the European debate on, on uh, the proper fiscal policy, on the ECB's monetary policy, and... Uh, um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, politically, you shouldn't underestimate, or it's hard to overestimate, the importance um, of, uh, of the project of this German government to actually execute the first fully balanced budget since 1969 um, in 2015. So there is a there is a, a fiscal policy in place for next year that is geared towards um, a balanced budget, and as I said, would be the first in 45 years, also in Germany, um, uh, despite all our austerity credentials, we haven't been as good as our reputation on that. Um, so that is that has been set out there as an as a as an important policy goal. Um, and it will not be easy for the German government to sort of move away from that. Um, but I think the, you know, I think some of what I tried to say earlier, the, the, ne the, the necessity and the urgency to strike a Franco-German bargain at the heart of the Eurozone to get out of that double impasse where we point fingers at the French saying you have to do your reforms first and they point fingers at the Germans and say you don't spend enough, you don't invest enough and you need to do that first and um, sort of w in the end I think we'll come to a solution that is a combination of both um, and we would uh, in, in Germany we would probably not openly call that um, you know a policy change or a correction of course um, but if you go through the history of the Euro crisis uh, you will find that the German government has, the, the German government, not German politicians, but the German government has been very careful not to criticize the European Central Bank for any of the measures it has undertaken, even though a lot of them over the last two years uh, certainly violate uh, orthodox German economic uh, and, and monetary thinking and certainly among German academics in the economics profession. So, uh, so the German, and Merkel has very recently, I think after the EU summit last week, has publicly in her press conference lauded uh, Mario Draghi's efforts uh, at diffusing uh, the Euro crisis and sort of endorsing his earlier statement uh, that he's willing to do whatever it takes. And, and I think that would be my, you know, that's my broader point, and I'm happy to repeat that in, in other words once again. Um, I, um, you know, I've been in so many discussions with people from Wall Street or the City of London um, uh, and some of, you know, the British media particularly who, who've been batting against the survival of the euro. And, uh, and they said, you know, you simply built it in the wrong way. It's going to, you know, it, it'll disintegrate. And you Germans, you won't be willing to... Uh, to pay what it takes to keep it together. And, and my response has always been that, uh, you know, you may have a point when it comes to the construction because having a single currency, having a monetary union without integrating fiscal and economic policy is an incomplete uh, construction. 
So you may have a point there, but you need to understand that the overall project of European integration is so fundamentally important. It is the, not just the economic, it's the overriding political lesson, a historical lesson uh, of German history that will do whatever it takes to make it work. And, and that is what has happened, and that is why all those uh, in, you know, among the hedge funds and others who batted against the survival of the euro, or who batted, uh, 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 who batted on, who bet on an outcome of, of an exit of, uh, of Greece, for example, in the summer of 2011, why they were all mistaken in the end, um, and why Germany has gone to great length, uh, and in reality, crossing more than one red line it had drawn in the sand before, in order to keep it together and in order to make it work, and I think that political logic is still very much at work uh, today. So you, you won't find as much talk about the dangers of deflation in the German public debate as you have in the debate in, in Brussels or in France or in Italy. Um, but it's not that uh, the larger point that you've raised is, uh, you know, is going unnoticed in Berlin these days. Can you come up with a good reason why, or an argument, why it'd be okay for Russia to keep Ukraine? U Ukraine or Crimea, or uh, cr uh, Crimea, or both? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, I would say you know Russia doesn't have Ukraine. If anything, I think Putin, with his actions, has contributed a great deal to a sense of nationhood of Ukrainians. Um, so he's, I would argue that by what he's done, he's actually lost Ukraine for Russia to a degree. Well, what you, you say, can I come up with a reason why he should keep Crimea? Uh, no, I can't. I think the annexation of Crimea, you know, the way it happened um, it was a blatant violation of international law and I think will continue to maintain that position and however we solve or we settle the Ukrainian crisis um, you know it it's not easy to come up with a scenario with a realistic scenario now how Russia would give Crimea back to Ukraine but that doesn't mean that we would ratify uh, or or uh, or approve of the annexation and my personal guess is the sanctions that we put in place in March, the, sort of the first stage of the sanctions that we put in place because of the annexation of Crimea, I think they will remain in place for a long, long time. I think um, Crimea will prove to be a very, very expensive uh, adventure uh, for Russia and, and life for people in Crimea because of that will be difficult whenever it comes to interaction um, with the West, sort of all kinds of travel, getting visas, and so forth, will be w that will be very, very difficult because we don't recognize uh, the annexation. Um, and there are examples for that. Uh, you know, if you take you know take the Baltic states that uh, became uh, came under Soviet uh, rule um, in the early 1940s until they became independent again in the early 1990s. The, the West never recognized that. Sort of in international law, we always maintained uh, that they were not part of the Soviet Union. Take the case of Northern Cyprus, which is a, a constant thorn in the side of uh, Turkey-EU relations. Um, so there, there are other examples in international law where you have a de facto situation that in legal terms, we don't recognize, and, I, and we won't recognize the annexation of Crimea. Okay. How have Germany's strong ties to both the United States and Russia affected, in a positive or negative way, its ability to facilitate international cooperation, and has this dynamic changed at all since the revelation of U.S. spying on the German government? Yeah, that's an interesting question. It's, uh, you know, first of all, I would say, yes, we have strong ties with the U.S. and strong ties with Russia, but I would not put them in the same sentence. Uh, I would always have a full stop between them because they are of a very different quality, extent, and nature. Um, 
secondly, um, you know, the German government, um, and particularly the Social Democrats, who sort of pride themselves on having invented uh, Ostpolitik in the 1960s, and sort of that has been their distinct contribution to the Federal Republic's foreign policy tradition um, throughout uh, the history of, of the Republic since 1949. They've always invested heavily into the idea that engaging Russia, including increasing economic interdependence, investing in economic modernization, would eventually also bring about um, a, uh, a social and political transformation of the country. And, and I think you know, that is that is what has been fundamentally questioned and, and challenged now over these past 10 months with the, with the Ukraine crisis and with Russian aggression. So there is a fundamental rethinking on what does that mean for our relationship with Russia. There were some polls in, early, in the early stages of the crisis, I think in March and April, that suggested something of almost an equidistant uh, 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 role for Germany. Um, so if, if you ask Germans, and I, uh, I think from public television there was a poll that asked the questions to, German, to Germans, where, do you, where would you like Germany to be sort of between the US and, or between the West and Russia, or on Russia's side, or on the West side? And, but it was, a, it was a rather peculiar way of framing the question. Um, but my point, even about that poll, was always uh, it doesn't only tell you something about the strength of German-Russian relations, where there's clearly no desire whatsoever in the German population to sort of return to a Cold War-style conflict with Russia. Um, it also tells you something about um, the state of German-American relations. Um, there are other polls that uh, uh, that that support that conclusion, the GMF's transatlantic trends, the Pew Global Attitudes poll, that um, public trust in Germany in the US as a partner has eroded significantly over the last year and a half, and to a degree that I can't quantify, but that you, know, you can easily deduct, is, uh, that is due also to the, to the Snowden revelations, to the whole sort of disappointment of, uh, of pervasive uh, eavesdropping and spying, and the whole question, sort of the, the fundamentally different concepts of privacy uh, and, and uh, a completely different balance in both countries of uh, privacy and security uh, in, in the digital arena. I, I think there's no doubt about that. So can I follow up on the issue of U.S.-German relations? Um, even before Snowden, or I would say especially before Snowden, uh, the, the sort of dominant narrative was that uh, Europeans were um, profoundly looking forward to the end of the Bush era and, and to a rapprochement because of their uh, sort of an alienation that set in after the invasion of Iraq and their sense that America was um, uh, playing fast and loose with international law and so on and so forth. But that um, uh, Obama came in and then showed no interest whatsoever in Europe. And, um, I'd be curious whether you think that that uh, you know, is a persistent and uh, justified narrative. Uh, obviously, there's been some disillusionment, particularly in Germany, much less so actually in other countries where spying is, I think, viewed as, uh, as uh, um, you know, uh, part of, the, uh, part of the, the nature of the world. But uh, particularly with that, that other uh, theme that uh, the U.S. Has, has lost interest in Europe um, perhaps in part because of the sense that it, it, it won't contribute enough uh, to uh, international uh, security, that, that it hasn't been uh, as active a partner, or that, frankly, it's a, it's a matter of personal uh, uh, idiosyncrasy that the president just wasn't interested. Um, well, I mean, uh, you're in a much better position to judge whether this administration in Washington has lost interest in Europe because you served in it and I didn't. Yes, but you I, um, <laughs> I, can, I can only say, because I, was at the, I served at the German embassy in Washington, D.C., covering that election campaign 
and the first year, almost the first year in office uh, of the Obama administration, that um, you know, some degree of disappointment was bound to happen because expectations were just so high in Germany. I, I remember when I was uh, at, at the embassy as a political counselor writing these, these reports about the, the election campaign that um, you know, I said there's almost more interest in Germany in this American election than there was in a Bundestag uh, sort of federal German election. Um, and, and so there was a, you know, there, there still is at the bottom of it, there is a, a fundamentally romantic notion about German-American relations also in the wider German public, one that is, you know, that is informed by the Berlin airlift experience, by, uh, you know, the, the romance with, uh, with John F. Kennedy in the 1960s and Kennedy's Ich bin ein Berliner speech in Berlin. And, and, um, and sort of Obama in many ways embodied that, um, sort of this, this notion that the Germans would love to love America again and here was a president we could, uh, you know, we could relate to. And if you look at the polling numbers in, you know, after that transition from, uh, from, from Bush 43 to Obama, it just, I mean, you know, he was far more popular in Germany than he ever was in the United States, even in his first year in office. Uh, so that was bound to be a disappointment on that. Um, and, and it didn't take too long for that to materialize, you know, be it on things Germans disapproved of, the, the drone war, the inability to close Guantanamo. And we don't have a very sophisticated perspective on uh, sort of the realities of divided government or the role of the US Congress, you know, and we see a president and he calls the shots, right? If that's not the reality in Washington, that's very difficult to explain to a wider audience back in, in Germany. So, so there was a degree of disappointment, but I think, um, you know, the Snowden revelations for, for these two reasons we talked about this morning had a particular impact on Germany. Um, the first, uh, the first being this romantic uh, notion of the relationship, which I think goes, goes deeper and has more of an emotional nature than is the case in, for many other European countries when they look at their relationship with the US. And secondly, um, on the spying business, um, that indeed the German uh, intelligence services largely rebuilt and trained by the Americans after the war um, had a sort of had a pretty um, they had a sense of what their job was and what their direction of their intelligence work was, and that was predominantly East. And that has remained like that uh, uh, until this, this day, at least mostly. And that therefore, uh, this sense of asymmetry uh, was very strong. Uh, and uh, whereas in other countries, indeed, there would be the answer, that's just what you know, that's what nations do to each other, let's face it. But that's not the, the, the predominant view in Germany on that. So I, we are coming close to the end, and I would like to get everyone who has a question, but I just wanted to know if there were any more student questions uh, before we uh, wrap up. This is your big moment. <laughs> okay. So we have a question right here. Could you expand a little more on the uh, evolution or evol uh, the evolving um, perceptions of uh, Russia and Putin and what he's up to, uh, why he's doing what he's doing, and how uh, you think you have to respond? Mm. So it's going beyond the sort of what we the sort of softer discussion into a little more of the uh, spy versus spy sort of perception or the chess game. Of yeah, I. Yeah, I mean, there's a, you know, we, we've had intense debates about this this year um, in the in the academic community, the think tank community, but also, you know, in government. Um, I think, you know, I'm not one of those who believes that Putin has somehow executed a long prepared strategy and that he is sort of he's executing a plan while we are continuous to continue to be surprised. I think he's been surprised on a number of occasions as well. I think he was surprised in the first place that President Yanukovych in Kiev was not able to hold on to power and that the Kremlin strategy of essentially with a $15 billion loan 
uh, to bribe Ukraine away from signing the association agreement with the European Union at the Vilnius summit in November a year ago, that that in the end didn't work out and that the Maidan sort of not only remained active throughout a very cold winter, but actually gained in strength in February and eventually ousted President Yanukovych uh, because they were looking, because they felt um, that they wanted a different orientation for Ukraine. And so, of course, the official Russian narrative is that this was all, you know, this was not indigenous, this was all uh, financed and fomented from abroad, if not by the CIA. Um, but, um, but, so I think there were, you know, that's when he decided to act on Crimea. And then he went further and he acted in eastern Ukraine. And he was surprised again to notice that there was really not much of public support in eastern Ukraine for a separatist movement. And that these groups were pretty much on their own. And that in the end, under the pressure of the Ukrainian military, Putin had to send in regular military forces in late August in order to prop up their position and sort of maintain that uh, if, if you want that, that bridge uh, um, uh, into Ukraine as a negotiating position for what is going on now in, in Minsk, uh, trying to hammer out a deal between Ukraine and, and Russia. So my sense is, so, so that's sort of where he has had to adjust his own strategy. The bigger question of what's driving him overall, I, I mean, my reading is, but I'm, that's not necessarily a consensus view in Berlin, um, there are those who say this is this has a long history. He he fought the war in Georgia in 2008, and really this is only a continuation of what he started in Georgia. Um, I'm not so sure about that. I, uh, I, you know, there's something to be said to that effect. But I think the turning point really came in the winter of 2011-2012 with the large demonstrations in Moscow. Uh, at the prospect of power again moving from Medvedev in the presidency to Putin uh, uh, ascending to the presidency for a second time. Um, people felt cheated. There was sort of, there was a, a sort of a middle class protest going on. And I think that that is when Putin himself decided that a strategy of modernizing Russia in cooperation with the West was in the end a dangerous strategy for him and for his, for his control of power in Russia. And you could see results of, of a strategy that defined Russia's future more and more in opposition to the West already far earlier than the Ukraine crisis in the crackdown on, on international NGOs, on domestic NGOs, on the whole LGBT community, sort of this whole notion that the West is promiscuous and decadent, and Russia is the true repository of of Western of of sort of universal values. Actually, notwithstanding notwithstanding sort of the sorry state of the Russian family or life expectancy rates of I don't know 58 years for for males in Russia, um, but this was th there's a whole narrative to that, including with the the um, sort of instrumentalizing the Orthodox Church. Uh, it to me it looks very much like a, um, you know, it's it's a circling of the wagons at home. Uh, it's looking for enemies abroad, a strategy of limited conflict. I I don't see this as a as necessarily sort of conflict at all cost. Um, I think he's very careful to calibrate it. He sends hot and cold signals of cooperation and defiance all the time. Um, so, but in many ways, I, mean, I think the big problem for us is that Putin has made Russia completely unpredictable and he's made unpredictability actually a hallmark of his strategy. Um, that will cost Russia dearly. I think the most significant um, cost for Russia is not the direct cost of sanctions imposed, but the indirect cost of investments not realized because companies simply say it's too unpredictable. They're talking here and there about nationalization of foreign investments. Why would I, uh, you know, in full knowledge of that, why would I invest even a single euro in that country? So I think while we overestimate sometimes the short-term effect of sanctions, because I don't think they will 
immediately change his behavior. We also have a tendency of underestimating the long-term effect of sanctions on the Russian economy. They will be devastating. I think Putin has essentially cut Russia off from any modernization option that Russia had. And there certainly is no option in Asia for that. Um, so, you know, but then that all leads to the larger question that I will leave unanswered here. Um, you know, is a weaker Russia, and I think we're on the path to a weaker Russia, is will that be an easier neighbor to deal with? Because it may well be a, an even more aggressive one, a more unpredictable one for the immediate neighborhood. Um, so um, I think we need to relearn, unfortunately, some of the lessons of the Cold War, certainly when it comes to deterrence and reassurance of, of the allies uh, um, and, and, and not only defending NATO territory, but sort of how to signal a credible security guarantee and defense guarantee for all, all members of NATO, and that includes the Baltic states. And uh, I think we're still, uh, we still have quite a way to go on that. Mm. Well, I think that's a, a great big picture note to uh, end on. And uh, I really want to thank you, Thomas. In addition to uh, this uh, event, I should say, Thomas has, has uh, been marching through uh, one event after another while he's been here, and uh, it's uh, remarkable that he still has vocal cords, um, and uh, is now known to uh, you know probably a third or a half of the uh, undergraduate body. So I, I really want to thank you for uh, giving us two days of your time. Uh, it's uh, amazing to me that you convinced uh, your boss to let you do that, but I'm not going to look behind the curtains on that one, and uh, I, I really do appreciate it. It's been wonderful to have you here. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.